Good morning. morning. How's everybody doing today? Just curious, how many people created their day this morning? Ah, you know why you didn't create your day? Because you don't believe it's possible yet. You see, if you knew it was true, you would wake up every morning excited to create your day, right? So we have to begin to understand then that we have an understanding of philosophy. The movie was great philosophy. It's what I call dinner conversation. It's got a lot of principles, of quantum physics and neuroscience and biology and genetics and receptor site physiology. All of that information is really great. But we have to begin to put the rubber to the road. We have to take this information in some way, apply it to our life, right? Otherwise, it's just good philosophy and nobody's changed from anything. So today I'd like to spend a little time with you and see if we can make some sense out of the world of quantum physics and your mind. Are you guys interested in that? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I was leaving my, my uh, office a couple months ago and, and uh, my, my staff member handed me this uh, sheet of paper and she said, listen, you have to read this, you know, quick and I'm on my way to catch a plane. And so I grab this piece of paper and it's this woman who decides to create her day. And she says, well, I never considered myself a special person, and uh, so I'm going to create my day, and I'm going to ask for a sign without a doubt that lets me know that I'm special, and I want it to come in a way that surprises me and that leaves no doubt in my mind that I made contact with the field. So she's driving down the road up this five-mile incline at sunset, And as she's driving up this road, a bald eagle flies in her car, (laughs) lands on her dashboard, spreads its wings out, makes eye contact with this woman. She pulls off the side of the road, and the eagle flies out the other window. And I said to my office uh, assistant, You email that woman back and you tell her if she has any doubt now that she's special, (laughs) we need to talk. Yes? So how come nothing new ever happens in our life? If the quantum law works, and we know that it does, then how come we keep having the same relationships or the same jobs or the same circumstances in our life? How come it's so routine and predictable that it seems that Newtonian physics is the law? because we haven't mastered this idea called observation. So this this one particular uh, researcher says, well, who do I know that, you know, that knows how to pay attention really well? So he gets on the phone, he calls the Dalai Lama, and he says, can you send me your eight best guys? I mean, I want to study these guys, and and I want to see what happens in their brain when they're focusing on a single-minded thing like compassion or divinity, or unconditional love. Now these guys, by the way, had over 40,000 hours of focused meditation. They spent over 40 years practicing. While you were laying on the beach, they were focusing on (laughs) single-minded thoughts. (laughs) And then they said, let's take a control group, just a group of people that, that are just average people and We'll, we'll use the monks and we'll, we'll, we'll teach him how to do this thing called focused concentration, what, what science is now called paying attention. <laughs> By the way, the average human being loses their attention span six to ten times a minute. How good is our observation? That's why only a few subatomic particles actually pay attention to our mind. So he said, okay. We're going to hook these guys up to these brain scans, particular ones called EEGs. And EEGs measure electromagnetic frequency that the brain emits. And so they took 256 electrodes and they covered their whole entire head. Can you picture these monks, you know, with the things? And then they ran the, all, the, all the feedback into a computer that created a holographic picture of the brain, and they were able to begin to measure brain activity. You guys with me? Yep. So 
they said to these monks, you know, be your normal self. They took eight of them, be your normal self. And then they said, okay, now listen, you guys, pay attention to compassion. Just close your eyes and pay attention to compassion. The moment they did that, all of a sudden, the frontal lobe lit up so much that the scientists had never seen that type of activity in that part of the brain. Now then they took the control group and they said, all right, you guys, pay attention to one thing. And of course, what happened? My back hurts. How long is this going to take? I don't really want to do this. Am I doing it right? <laughs> I wonder what my kid's doing. I got to buy dinner, you know, all that stuff. And guess what happened to their frontal lobe? Meh. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Now, in one particular monk, there's a part of the frontal lobe on the left side, which is really the happy spot in the brain. And this guy's left frontal lobe was so ignited that the scientist said, this guy's got to be the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> They'd never seen activity like this before. But then the scientists began to think about this. And what they said was, you know, maybe paying attention and concentration and observation is a skill. Just like tennis or golf. And you can improve it if you keep practicing it. Now think about this. The brain is the instrument that we use. It's the machinery for us to process thought. How many people accept that? And it also has some automatic processes that'll give, that allow us to function. But for the most part, it's the greatest area in the body where there's the greatest number of neurons clustered together. And where you have the greatest number of neurons clustered together, you have the greatest intelligence. So the brain is the central clearinghouse of intelligence. Mind, by the way, is what the brain does. Mind is the brain in action. It's the brain at work. When we can measure a working brain, we're studying mind. Are you guys with me? Six to ten times? Hello? You guys with me? So mind is when the brain is in action. So when we're using functional brain scans and we're studying how the brain works, we're studying this concept called mind. You understand? Then here's my question. If the brain is the instrument for intelligence or processing thought, and mind is what the brain does, if you can improve the way your brain works, who's doing the improving? And it's that nasty 13-letter word called consciousness. That's the only solution. Consciousness is our self-aware, free-willed individual that is really not the body, is not the brain, and is not the mind. As a matter of fact, consciousness is what manipulates the brain to produce mind. You understand that? The brain processes 400 billion bits of information every second. You know that? I said it in the movie. <laughs> but we're only aware of about 2,000 of those 400 billion bits of information. And you know what those 2,000 bits of information have to do with? Three things, and only three things. The body, the environment, and time. That's it. You know, does your back hurt? you have a headache? Are you tired? Is it too cold in here? Is it too bright in here? Is it too dark in here? You like the way the person smells sitting next to you. You even like the person next to you. How long is this guy going to talk before we can break? And that's where all of our self-awareness is on. It's only on the body, the environment, and time. And yet billions of bits of information is being processed by the brain. Now, when we can take consciousness, self-awareness, and move it away from the body, the environment, and time, we no longer have to live by the laws of the body, the environment, and time. And when we're able to do that, we begin to open the door to walk into the quantum field. Now, it's true I've been studying spontaneous remissions of diseases. It's kind of been my interest for the last seven years. People that have had um, cancer and diabetes and um, emphysema and endocrine conditions, thyroid conditions, 
um, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, rare genetic disorders that even medical science didn't have a solution for. And these people all of a sudden became healthy. And they weren't all Roman Catholic. And uh, they all didn't believe in the same God. They, didn't, uh, they weren't all vegetarians. Uh, they didn't, uh, not all of them uh, uh, used crystals. As a matter of fact, none of them did. Uh, they didn't trust the astrology charts. None of that was in common amongst these people. There were four things that I found in common amongst every person that had a spontaneous remission. Four major things and two minor things. The first thing that was co in common with every person that had a spontaneous remission was that every person accepted and believed that there was an intelligence that lived within them. Did you hear what I said? Within them. That somehow was giving them life. There was some spiritual aspect of themselves that didn't exist. Where does religion always say that is? They didn't say that. They said, There's, I'm connected to some mind that's so much greater than my mind. I'm connected to... Uh, uh, a force that's so much greater than uh, me, a will that has so much more will than I have, and loves me more than I even love myself. And they said, if I could just make contact with this intelligence, it would do the healing for me. Does that make sense? So what they said was, they said, you know, <clears throat> I'm riding on the back of a giant, and I just got to learn how to whisper in its ear. Now, I want to demystify this a little bit, okay? Because when we talk about spirituality or spiritual you know, laws, everybody all of a sudden has no imagery in their brain to be able to process that, right? It's nebulous. But so let's demystify that. Do you know that that intelligence gives life to every human being on this planet? It, gives, it holds order in the universe, and you're connected to it. It's the same intelligence right now that's keeping your heart beating. Your, part, your heart bumps, uh, pumps over two gallons of blood a minute, over 100 gallons of blood an hour. It pumps over 100,000 times a day through 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Three billion times in one lifetime. No repair, no checks. It does it independent of your moods your likes, your dislikes, your opinions. It continuously gives you life. Now, are you thinking about doing that? Or is there some order of intelligence doing it for you? It's the same intelligence that's digesting your breakfast and breaking down proteins and carbohydrates and fats into simple products so they can be reassembled for regeneration. And we don't even think about that. See, you and I, free-willed individuals, get a free ride. And something loves us enough to continuously give us life. It's the same intelligence, by the way, that's making 10 million cells every second. Because you know you lose 10 million cells every second. Whoops, you just made another 10 million. <laughs> Were you thinking about that? Or is something loving you enough to give you life? And that in every single cell in your body, out of the 100 trillion cells, one cell goes through 100,000 chemical reactions a second. Now multiply that by 100 trillion. And if you don't think that we're connected to a greater mind, <laughs> we need to rethink it. And that there are little enzymes that zip through your DNA. There's 3.2 billion nucleic acids that make up DNA in one cell. As a matter of fact, geniuses, if we took one DNA, you know, the whole strand of DNA out of one cell, and we straightened it out, it would be six feet long. You have enough DNA in your body to go from here to the sun and back 150 times. So they said, something has assembled who I am, it's got a greater mind than I do because I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And it's got a greater will than I do because I don't think I can keep my heart beating more than a few seconds without thinking about my visa account. <laughs> and, 
and it loves me enough to put up with me. And they said, I got to just surrender. I got to get out of the way enough to let this thing do it for me. I just got to direct it and then get out of the way. That was the first thing they had in common. The second thing they had in common is that they all said this. You know, my thoughts or my attitude, you know, an attitude is a cluster of thoughts pasted together. My attitude created my condition. You know, I've been a victim for the last 15 years. I, can't, I could never get over it, and it's worked really well for me to get what I want. Or I've been an angry person, and I've hated my parents for the last 15 or 20 years, and I've got to stop that. It was actually me and who I was being that created this state of health that I'm in. You with me? Yeah. Now, do you know that every time you have a thought, you make a chemical? And if you have great thoughts and unlimited thoughts or happy thoughts, you make chemicals that make you feel happy or good. And if you have negative thoughts or bad thoughts or contracted thoughts, you make chemicals that make you feel bad. Does that make sense? Yeah. So imagine, right? You, you, you have an insecure thought. What's the next thing that happens? You feel insecure, right? Now here's the bad news. The moment you start to feel insecure, the next thing you do is you start to think the way you're feeling, which then makes more chemicals so that you can feel the way you're thinking and think the way you're feeling. And we get caught in this loop between thinking and feeling. This is the human drama. And what ultimately happens, listen to this, is that feeling becomes the means of thinking. And what that really means then, geniuses, is that mind is now immersed in the body. You're not thinking as a mind. You're not thinking as a conscious being. You're thinking as a body because body is determining the outcome based on a feeling. So we call that a state of being. So the person can't think any other way than the way that they feel. So they wake up in the morning and they feel bad and they start to think bad and then they start to feel bad and they spend the whole day perceiving their day based on a feeling. Now the body should be the servant to the mind. When this happens now, it's the mind that's the servant to the body. Quantum law still apply? Absolutely, which means then that the person can only live out their genetic destiny. Nothing new will ever happen. Am I making sense? Yes. <clears throat> now the third thing they had in common is that they all said this. You know what? I have to reinvent myself. I got to become somebody else. I can't be this miserable victim for the rest of my life. I got to become somebody else. Now the moment they did that, they started to ask themselves some really important questions. Questions that most people don't have the time to think about. Questions like, what would it be like to be a happy person? Who do I know in my life that's happy? What would I have to change about myself to live in joy? Who in history do I admire that was great? And at what point did I lose it and believe this is who I am? And you know, the moment we ask those important questions, guess what part of the brain turns on? Frontal lobe. You know why? Because when we're running automatic programs that determine who we are, we're using the rest of the neocortex. It's all based on association and memory. When we stop those automatic programs, it's the moment when you ask those important questions, the brain puts the brakes on and has to reassemble a new way of firing to produce an answer to that question different than the way you've always thought. You understand that? So they put the brakes on to the automatic programs and they said, what would it be like? They started to speculate because the brain, the frontal lobe is the speculator. It's the part of the brain that likes to examine the what ifs. And they started to gather information. They started to read at the same time as contemplate about a future. And their brain started to reorganize itself in a new way. You with me? So, do you think that you can change the circuits in your brain by thinking about it? Do you? So I did this experiment a little ways back. 
They took these people who uh, never played the piano before. You guys with me? And they separated them into four categories and they said, listen, we're going to scan your brains before you learn this, these, uh, these exercises and then we're going to scan your brain after. And all you have to do is show up for two hours a day in practice for two weeks. Okay? And just follow the instructions. And we're going to hook your brain up to these sophisticated scans and we're going to see what happens before and after. So they got with these people and they said, okay, first group, here's the scales and here's the chords. They're one-handed exercises. Practice them over and over again. Keep playing them. So they played every single day, two hours a day for two weeks. They scanned their brains before, they scanned their brains after. After two weeks, guess what happened? A whole new set of circuits lit up in their brain that never lit up before. That makes sense. You learn something new. Learning is making new connections. Repeating it over and over again is sustaining or maintaining those connections, and that's called memory. So they memorized what they were doing by physically practicing or personalizing what they learned. Make sense? Standard, simple. They took the second group of people and they said, listen, we want you to play two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to scan your brain before and after, but you know what we're going to do? We're not going to tell you how to play anything. You just come and do whatever you want. Play whatever you want. So at the end of two weeks, guess what happened to them? Nothing. You know why? Because they couldn't remember what they had learned the day before. And they couldn't remember what they played the day before, and they, they had no structure. They got no instruction and no knowledge to be able to apply it to make some steady circuits. Still with me? Make sense? Took the third group of people, they said, listen, don't even show up. <laughs> don't even create your day. Same thing. Nothing happens. Last group of people, they said, listen, we want you to come two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to show you these one-handed exercises. But instead of you physically playing the piano, we want you to mentally rehearse over and over again those exercises. And we know you're going to get tired, so we'll nudge you, and we'll keep you awake, but you practice for two hours a day, and you keep repeating those. At the end of two weeks, they rescan their brain, and guess what happened? Same area of the brain lit up as if they were actually playing the scales. Now, you know what that means? They grew new circuits in their brain just by thinking about it. Just by thinking, just by rehearsing. Now, every time we learn something new, we make new circuits in the brain. If you learn anything new, learning is making a new connection in the brain, new neurological connection. Memory is maintaining or sustaining those connections, keeping them alive. And the only way that we maintain and sustain connections in the brain is by repetition. Repetition allows the neurons to develop a long-term relationship. So these people, every single day, made it the most important thing. They gave up their social engagements. They gave up television. They said, I'm going to rehearse. I'm going to mentally rehearse the greatest ideal of myself every single day. And as long as I keep doing it every day, what's going to happen to those circuits? They're going to light up and become the more sustainable circuits to act as a platform of who they will become in the future. Am I making sense? Now, the last thing that they had in common, which I find the most important, is that during this process of rehearsal, while they were sitting down rehearsing who they were going to be, just like the piano players, rehearsing over and over again, They had long moments where they lost track of time and space. In other words, they became so involved with what they were doing that when they opened their eyes or they lifted up their eye masks or when they turned the lights on in the room, it was two hours later and it only seemed like five minutes. They were so involved with what they were doing that they lost the feedback of the body. They lost the feedback from the environment and they lost track of time. And the moment that that happens, geniuses, that's the moment we walk through the door to the quantum field. And that is the moment, by the way, according to neuroscience, that we repattern and rewire the brain. And by the way, guess what part of the brain is the most active when we do that? Frontal lobe, because isn't it true that we're making thought more real than anything else in that moment? And because the frontal lobe is the orchestra leader, it has its connections to the rest of the brain. And what it does is it quiets down the association centers, 
the thinking centers. It quiets down the motor centers. You don't want to move. You could still. It quiets down the emotional centers. And the only thing that's real is the thought. And when we capture that thought in the frontal lobe, when the frontal lobe captures it, as, as we hold that thought there, what happens is the rest of the neurons in the brain will pattern and make circuits to capture that thought and reflect it as a footprint of whatever we're focusing on. Does that make sense? Because it's as if we were experiencing it. And when we make new circuits in our brain, by the way, do you think that we'll perceive things that maybe already existed but we never really saw? Do you think that's possible? Do you think that the person who lives practicing being a victim every day gets good at it? Turn that on automatically? Yeah. Is it natural and second nature? And how will they perceive their world based on how they're wired? According to the law of a victim. A victim. Would you agree? Everything is a reason to suffer. Would you accept that? Yeah. Simple quantum law, right? Yeah. So if you made new circuits in your brain, do you think you may process or see things in, in your reality different because now you're wired to see them? Do you accept that? Yeah. So if I put up a picture of a Monet on the screen up here, and I said to you, isn't that a beautiful picture of uh, what Monet painted? You guys would all say, oh yeah, that's beautiful. And then I took the picture down and I said, did you guys know anything about Monet? Do you know that he spent 44 years of his life teaching himself how to see things differently? And he thought that every person was too busy to stop and pay attention to light. And he loved light. He loved the light first thing in the morning. And he loved the light at sunset, at the twilight hour. And he said that the golden light of the twilight hour and the brightness and the opalescent light in the morning actually colored reality. And that he said, if I can capture this in my paintings and make things bright enough and capture light, maybe people will stop and look and see what they never pay attention to. And then he said, you know, the wisteria and the bridge are one and the same. I can't paint them separate. They're the same to me. And as he got older, he developed cataracts. And the cataracts were so thick that when he looked at the light, it diffused the patterns. So he began to more and more paint exactly what he was seeing. And the doctors urged him to have an operation to do something to help him. And you know what he said? I work too hard to see this way. <laughs> now, if I took that painting and I put it back up on the screen, would you see it differently? Yeah. Would you agree that because you learned new knowledge and new information, you made new circuits to perceive what was already there, but you never paid attention to? Yeah. Reality is the same way. How about the wine connoisseur? A 1992 Cabernet Sauvignon Silver Oak Alexander Valley. Good bottle of wine. You take that and you give it to the wine connoisseur and he lets it breathe. He knows about tannins. He knows about alcohol content. He knows about oaky flavors. He knows about grapes. He knows about age. He knows about aroma and sweetness. You think his brain is wired to perceive what wine is all about? Did he pay attention through knowledge, long enough period of time to wire his brain to perceive subtleties in wine so that he would enjoy every single taste in that wine. Yeah. You take the person who drinks the screw-off tops, <laughs> you give him the 92 Cabernet, what happens? I don't taste any difference because he's not wired to. Do you understand? Reality is the same way. The reason that the movie is so great is because now you're paying attention to things that you normally never paid attention to. But do they exist all the time? Yeah. If the brain processes 400 billion bits of information every second, is it possible that we're missing some of reality? Yeah. Is it true? Yeah. So now, science used to say that the brain was hardwired, meaning that it was you know, wired so intently from genetics that you're going to be born a certain way, and then you're going to turn out just like your parents. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. So it's a predetermined life and you know, get what you can in the process. And now what they're saying is, whoops, we lied. It's not true. You see, the brain is hardwired. There's certain definite areas that are hardwired because the brain, human brain has been around for 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, whether you want to believe it or not. It's been around for millennia. And this process of learning has developed the brain. Now, when the sperm and the egg come together in utero, right around the third month of life, the cells start to differentiate and we start to make neurons. And they start migrating north up to the skull. And then around the sixth month of life, we start making these connections. The neuron looks like an oak tree, but it's not big like an oak tree. It's tiny and it's flexible like cooked spaghetti and it's leafless and it's three-dimensional. And where neurons connect with other neurons, that's called a memory, something that we've learned. That's information being exchanged. Now, at the third month of life, we make about 8,000 neurons per minute. At the sixth month of life, those neurons start to develop, connect, you know, making connections, and we make about 4 million connections a second, all the way through the time we're two years old. So the brain becomes this three-dimensional tapestry of neurological connections. And what's being transferred to the fetus is knowledge pre-programmed connections so that you can turn your head towards a sound and you know what to do when you're when you're sad and there's and you know what to do in case there's a threat or stress from your environment so we have certain pre-wired patterns that have been shaped and developed from eons of trial and error and one brain human brain looking next to another human brain looks almost exactly the same as a matter of fact, if I took two brains and unscrewed your head and placed them side by side, you wouldn't really tell who was who because the same folds and convolutions are similar from brain to brain. That's like your hand. Everybody's got a hand, right? It roughly looks the same. But then those intricate connections and patterns that form, those connections and circuits that form then become the fingerprints of who we are. And we get specific traits, propensities, and characteristics that are inherent from our parents. And by the way, those are the things that they've learned. Those are the things that they've experienced. Those are the propensities and traits and emotional tendencies. So you may inherit your mother's insecurity and your father's anger. You may have your father's intelligence and your mother's creativity. But they're going to give you, contribute their best. In other words, they're going to give the fetus they're going to create a new being, and they're going to give to them what they've practiced the most. You understand? Yes. Now, that's only, by the way, 50% of who we are. No one likes that, but it's true. <laughs> it's 50%. That's it. The other 50% is up to us to begin to make our own circuits and our own connections. Now, there's only two ways that we make connections in the brain. Only two ways. The first way we make connections in the brain is from knowledge that we gain, information, philosophy. Every time you learn something semantically new, every time you learn a new bit of information, you made a new connection. Did you guys make any connections today? So learning is making those connections. So it would be like if I handed you a book on how to ride a bicycle. And I said, read the whole entire book because I'm going to test you in two weeks know how to change a flat tire, know how to tighten the spokes, know how to shift gears, know how to brake, learn about this mystical thing called balance, and I'm going to test you in two weeks. And you would read that information and study it and repeat it till you did what? Repeated it enough till it was wired. Now it's being stored as a long-term memory. So that's philosophy, right? You're basically studying someone else's experience. And you are literally wiring your brain so that you can have that experience. Would you agree? Which, by the way, is the second way we make connections in the brain, is through experience. Experience is what enriches the brain. Now listen to this. Every time we experience something, every time we experience something new, when we're experiencing it, all of our five senses are immersed in the, in the process. What we're seeing and smelling and tasting and feeling and hearing, all of our five senses are picking up information from the environment and sending a rush of data back to the brain. And through these five pathways, this rush of data through five different ways causes neurons in the brain to fire and sting. And when they do that, they release these chemicals called neurotransmitters that make us feel a certain way. 
So the end product of an experience is called an emotion or a feeling. Still with me? So then, if an emotion or a feeling is the end product of an experience then, if we keep experiencing the same emotions every day, what does that tell us? We're not having any new quantum law apply to that? As a matter of fact, if you keep your mind on those same emotions, by the law of the quantum, you know, quantum realm, basically, we're putting our attention on something that we already know from the past. And what do we get? More of the same. So when we live by emotional propensities and emotional addictions, what we're really saying is, my observation is on something that's familiar to me based on the past, and I will keep observing it to keep it intact so that my future looks just like my past. And people who say, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm suffering terribly, but I don't, I don't want to leave this relationship because it doesn't feel right. Which really means I'm too addicted to feeling to do anything else. Because the moment we give up the continuity of thinking and feeling, we break the addiction. All of a sudden, all the cells of the body, you know, who are used to getting all those molecules, all of a sudden go like this. <laughs> what is she doing up there? She's no longer providing the chemistry to make me feel the way I like to feel. So let's get together and they say, okay, well, let's send the message back up to the brain. Right? And all the cells send the message back up the brain, and what happens? You start to hear these little voices, right? Go ahead, come on, get angry. Go ahead, come on, feel bad. That's because that's the body telling you that it's used to some chemical state. That's the body determining reality. And when the body determines reality, what it's saying is, is that we are living based on some past addiction. So emotions and feelings are the end product of an experience. And, if, and when we experience something, the feeling that we have from that experience helps us to remember the experience better. Would you agree? Absolutely. Do you know where you were on 9-11? Yeah. Do you know? You know why you know that? Because you remember the feeling, right? So the feeling helped you remember the experience better. So if feelings and emotions are the end product of an experience, and the person is experiencing the same feeling every day, what does that tell you? They're defining themselves from some past experience. Are there new experiences, geniuses, to have in the quantum field yes. that have new emotions? Yes. Could you create a new experience that's going to produce a new sensory feedback to the brain that's going to have a new emotion? Yes. And that new emotion then will help you to remember that experience better? And so can you picture in the quantum field future experiences that you would like to have that have nothing to do with survival, yes. nothing to do with pain, Nothing to do with sexuality, nothing to do with success and power and control, but all those virtues that we secretly hope for, those are the end products of being able to experience something different than survival. But you see, we're so wired for survival that the human being thinks that what's happening out there is more real than what's happening in here. Do you know that it takes 17 years, according to the latest research, 17 years for a new piece of information to be implemented into the current system. So we're living by past paradigms. The reason you're here, by the way, is because you believe in something else. Is that true? Yes. And let me warn you, please, do not wait for science to give you permission to do the supernatural. Let's go out and do it and then have science come and study us. Because if we do that, don't we make science the next religion? And then we have to live by their convention and their conformity? Why not go out and try it out, apply the knowledge, so have to have a new experience? And then, if you're able to do that experience over and over again, have science come and say, how do you do that? And you say, come and study my brain. I'll show you how it's done. Does that make sense? So experience, then, is the end product of when we apply knowledge. In other words, when you get on that bike and ride that bicycle now, wouldn't you agree that when you drive and you hit the curb and you fall and you skin your knee, are you gaining information from your experience? Yeah. That your senses are processing it. And then you get back on the bike and you start to pedal and then you get a flat tire. You have to get off the bike and you start changing the tire and you scratch your knuckle on the spoke. Are you getting more information? Help you understand what it is to ride a bicycle? 
Then you get back on the bike and you start to pedal up the hill. And oh my God, your legs are burning. Are you still learning from the experience of how to ride a bicycle? You're remembering that. Then you get to the top of the hill and all of a sudden you go down the hill and all the pain goes away and the wind is blowing in your face and your hair standing up and tears are running off the sides of your face. Are you, is your senses processing more information? Are you recording that about the experience of how to ride a bicycle? And you start pedaling so fast that the chain falls off. So you've got to get off and change the, bike, the chain. And as you're changing the chain, you put the chain back on and then you wipe your nose and get your grease under your mouth. And then you smell that smell. Are you still learning? Are you associating now from the experience of what it is to ride a bicycle? So the richness of life is experience. So knowledge and information is for the mind and the brain. And experience is for the body. And knowledge is the precursor to the experience. In other words, we're only limited by our knowledge. And when we can take knowledge and personalize it, we set ourselves up for a new experience. As a matter of fact, the whole reason to be alive is to learn something new, modify our behavior to produce a new outcome. That's called evolution. Now, what makes us so unique, geniuses, as human beings, is that when other species are subjected to harsh environmental conditions, right? They have to continuously expose themselves to it over and over again until they start to modify their behavior. <clears throat> Thank you. And as they start to modify their behavior, after several generations, they may be able to change their genetics and produce a, a way to acclimate or, or change as a result of that environmental stimuli. What's that called? Evolution, right? But that may take thousands of years. Human being doesn't have to do that. Human being, because of the size of the frontal lobe, can change in a year, can modify themselves in a week, can become a different person in a day. We can evolve ourselves and become somebody else and not have to go through the long continuum of trial and error. But you see, the brain only exists in two real states, according to me. <laughs> at my present state of ignorance. <clears throat> Two real states. We have survival and we have creation. And creation falls under the category of learning and experiencing. And survival falls under the category of responding to the environment so much that it then becomes, listen to this, it then becomes the environment that is creating our reality. Did you hear me? Because as the environment pushes the circuits in the brain and we respond to those environmental stimuli, the body becomes prepared for the threat or the stress, which then causes the brain to think a certain way, which then creates the same reality in the future. So we're these human beings with these big brains, but we're living in the rudimentary part of the nervous system that's based on survival. And by the way, 90% of the time that we're awake and aware, we're living in survival. You know, responding to the environment. Allowing the environment to determine our internal state. And the, and, the, and the confusion we have as human beings, you see, the present moment right now is created from the thoughts of where? Right? So then, the thoughts of now are creating what? So most people, though, they say, oh, I'm going to sit down and create my day. I'm going to sit down and create wealth. And they sit down for 10 minutes. They get up and they start looking in their bank account for the, for the transfer. <laughs> and then they say, what? Didn't work. But you know, we Americans, by the way, are the most difficult audience to talk to. We go to South America. We go to Europe. We go to Asia. People accept this. But Americans are so desensitized to so much stimuli. They get you know, 2,000 channels on their television. They have opinions about everything. They're into convenience. If your internet connection doesn't come up in 30 seconds, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> And so if, if you know, we don't get what we focus on in our arrogance, we all of a sudden say it didn't work. Well, you know, the quantum field works. It's us that don't work. And as we begin to develop the skill of paying attention, 
We're holding on to an observation, by the way, independent of the environment, independent of our body, independent of time. And by the way, those are the heroes that we fall in love with, isn't it? Whether it's Martin Luther King or William Wallace, or Churchill or any of those guys, you know what they said? They said, my observation matters. And I'm going to hold on to this thought, and I don't care how long it takes. And I'm going to hold on to this thought, and I'm not going to compromise it for anybody. Nothing in my environment is going to cause me to let go of my belief. I'm going to hold on to this observation, and I don't care what it feels like, because I'm accepting this more than I'm accepting anything else. And you can do whatever you want, but this is what's more real to me. And when we have that skill of observation, don't you think that the observer is going to start getting on board? Don't you think that's possible? So we have to develop that skill. We have to develop that skill. And because we're so prone to convenience that when it doesn't show up the same day within a matter of moments, we discount its possibility. Why not fall in love with an abstraction? Something that you haven't experienced yet. But if you can put all of your mind into that abstraction, don't you think that that abstraction will be your future? Don't you think that's possible? And don't you think you'll wire your brain to be exactly what your future dictates? You see, we can't get anything in our life that we're not first wired for. You can't be wealthy unless you're wired for wealth. So once we're wired for it, implicitly wired, non-declaratively wired, when we've wired it so much that we don't have to think about it anymore, that's the moment we are it. And that's the moment it takes no effort to have the side effect of who we are as a mind show up in our life. Does that make sense? I have a friend who's a millionaire. I went to lunch with him. He said to me, <clears throat> uh, today I lost everything that I owned. Pass the ketchup. And I looked at him, and I pushed the ketchup over there, and I was talking to me, and I said, Jerry, aren't, aren't you upset? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you lost everything you, you, know, you owned. He said, what? He said, I am money. I'm, I'm, I've made it thousands of times. I've made it a hundred times. I'm going to go make it back in two weeks. So the question is, who are we going to rehearse ourselves to be every morning? Can you rehearse in the morning your greatest ideal? and activate those circuits. And as you rehearse those ideals for yourself and activate those circuits, won't they be the platform of who you become?